Okay. All right, so continue on with our upper limb exploration. And we finished the arm, so we're now going to move into the cubital fossa um, and then into the forearm. So, cubital fossa, remember, is that, that region of transition between the arm and the forearm. It is bordered by two muscles on the, the inferior medial and lateral borders, the brachioradialis here, and the pronator teres here. Okay. Superior border is a line between the lateral and medial epicondyles here. So that's kind of our triangular region. Remember we have the tendon for the biceps brachii come down into the cubital fossa to its attachment point. And then we have the bicipital aponeurosis, which is that flatter, broader part of the tendon here that wraps over some of the deeper structures of the cubital fossil, namely the brachial artery and the median nerve. Okay. <coughs> All right, um, then really the only other thing I want to point out about it is that we have the, um, the radial nerve coming in kind of on the lateral side of the cubital fossa and this is where it sends its deep branch down um, that wraps around to the back of the, the forearm. And then finally we have the superficial veins here which um, run over the, the top of the fascia that overlies the cubital fossa. And obviously those are the ones that you phlebotomists know very, very well. <laughs> and probably anybody else who's done any, any blood draws. <clears throat> so just remember it's the um, basilic vein and the cephalic vein. Um, and then there's the medial cu median cubital vein that runs between them. All right, so just a quick peek at su surface location for anybody who this would be helpful for. So again, we're looking at this, this triangle right here between the <coughs> pronator, pronator teres, brachioradialis, and then lying right about the crease of the elbow there. All right, and then here, the cubital vein running through, right through it. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Okay. Um, that's pretty much all you need to know about the cubital fossa at this point. I'm sure you'll get to know it nice, um, very well as you're doing IVs and all that stuff if you don't know it well already. So that's, that's about it. Okay, so then we talked about the proximal ulna already and we'll just talk about quickly the distal portion of the ulna. There's just two, two things, the basic, the attachment for the articular disc, which is obviously important, and then the ulnar styloid process. This is a process for ligament attachment of the wrist joint. Okay. Radius, distal part of the radius. <coughs> Excuse me. The radius also has a styloid process, so that, that process protruding out. Uh, again, important for ligament attachment. What other ones did I want you to know on this? All right. Uh, and then the ulnar notch here, where it articulates with the ulna. So remember the ulna had a radial notch at the, the proximal end here where the radius can, constitutes the more of the joint, the ulna it articulates with it um, in, a, in a notch on the radius as well. So the connection between those two. Uh, something that might be helpful to remember is that the radius has a broad end at the wrist joint. Okay, so this, this wrist joint is broad, whereas the ulna, the broad end is at the elbow joint. And that may, be, may or may not be helpful when looking at radiographs, remembering where things are and which is which. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. Any, uh, everything good there? All right. So nice, simple so far. All right, so remember we had an interosseous membrane of the leg. 
Oh, because we've got the two, two bones in that portion of the limb. Well, the same as the forearm. So we have the radius and the ulna. And then in, in between them, we have our interosseous membrane. Uh, remember that it's helping to stabilize the position of the two bones relative to each other, uh, forming crawling on me, oh my gosh. Uh, forming that uh, type of solid joint. Do you remember this type of solid joint that it is? Syndesmosis. Mm -hmm. And then like the uh, leg, we also have apertures in the interosseous membrane um, to allow for vasculature and, and nerves to run between the, the anterior and posterior compartments. All right. Hmm. Okay, so the rest of this is, time is mostly going to be muscles. And I'm, going to, I'm arranging it slightly differently because there is a whole ton of muscles in the forearm, as you guys are well aware. And so I'm going to, to arrange it a little bit more functionally. So looking at different functional groups and the commonalities between those. Okay. So first of all, we'll start off with the groups that cause pronation and supination. So remember our pronators are pronator teres and pronator quadratus. They're so nice and gave them good descriptive names. It's great. Uh, and so when they contract, so you can see, you see how the pronator quadratus is kind of wrapped over the um, anterior surface of the, of the bones there. When it contracts, it pulls the radius over the ulna and causes it to rotate as it's contracting because its insertion is on the, the lateral part of the radius. And its um, <coughs> excuse me, origin is on the, la the medial part of the ulna. So it's, it's, it's wrapped all the way around it. So, it, so as it pulls, not only is it going to pull the, the bone, the radial bone over the ulna, it's actually going to cause it to rotate. And remember, it is the, the nature of the, the radial head and that annular ligament that allows for that radial head to rotate in its socket easily. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Excuse me. The pronator teres also really helps to pull the, the radius over the top of the ulna, so rotate them in relation to each other. Okay. Supination, and it's obviously going to happen partially just because of uh, relaxation of the pronator muscles, but then we'll finish the movement by um, contracting the supinator and the biceps brachii. So those two. <coughs> and the supinator uh, wraps around the radius and attaches to its um, more anterior side. So when, when the radius is already rotated, um, that insertion point has rotated around and, and is facing more uh, medially. So then contraction of the supinator is going to pull that, that um, radius back around into its normal position. So undo the rotation. All right. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. And then the axis of movement, just remember the axis of movement is at the fourth digit. And the reason for that is that is where the end of the ulna aligns with, okay? And so this is, this is why um, we think of radial movement around the ulna. The ulna is our, our stable point because that's our, our Access of movement there. Okay. Make sense? Cool. All right. Hmm. So, in the anterior compartment of the arm, we've got superficial muscles, and we've got, let's go for the groups of the superficial muscles. So, we have um, wrist joint flexors. So, which are, which are our, our flexors of the wrist joint? You remember? Flexor carpi ulnaris, flexor carpi radialis, and then our pulmaris longus. Okay, these are all wrist extension. Wait, flexors. Sorry, flexor. Thank you. <laughs> I've been going over these in my head all through my proctoring my exam, so I've got them all sorts of scrambled right now. Okay, wrist flexors, okay. Some commonalities, they uh, originate on the 
<coughs> excuse me, medial epicondyle or thereabouts, so near, on or near the medial epicondyle. <coughs> they typically insert on the tarsal, or not tarsal, carpal or metacarpal bones. So we can see here a lot of them at attachment to the proximal part of the metacarpal and then also <coughs> the distal carpal bones. Okay. The exception to that is the palmaris longus, which uh, extends as the palmar, palmar aponeurosis here. And um, actually, we could blow this up, couldn't we? There we go. Come on. Aha, there we go. And this is that broad ligament ish tendinous um, structure that moves across the palm of the hand. It has its it insertion then on the proximal phalange instead of the um, metacarpals and, and carpal bones. Okay, so here's for the, the couple of additional functions for the palmar upon neurosis. Um, obviously that broad sheet of connective tissue is going to protect underlying structures. But also, um, this is, it's anchoring the skin of the palm and helps offset the forces, uh, resist the forces of skin slippage as you are gripping something. So think of like hanging off a pull-up bar. The skin is being, being pushed up this way, right? So the palmar upon neurosis is going to help resist that by its, its anchoring of the, of the skin and also that, um, <coughs> excuse me, the contraction of the palmaris longus will help offset that slippage as well. So that stabilizes, stabilizes the structure. Okay. Right, so those are the wrist flexors. And then obviously we have our pronator teres as well that we, that we saw before. Okay. Just a quick note about the flexor carpi ulnaris is, is in addition to uh, having a head on the uh, humerus, the medial condy epicondyle of the humerus, it also has a head on the, the ulna there. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, right, and then what, what nerves are innervating these? Does anybody know? So most of them are the median nerve, okay, except for one of them. Which one would be different? Palmaris ulnaris. The flexor carpi ulnaris, because anything with ulnaris is very typically innervated by the ulnar nerve. Yeah. <coughs> All right. So then we have intermediate and deep layers of the anterior compartment. Uh, the intermediate layer exists with just one muscle, the flexor digitorum superficialis. And then the deep has um, the other fl digital flexor, uh, the flexor digitorum profundus. And then our flexor pollicis longus for the thumb. <clears throat> Something to note about the um, digit flexors is the locations they uh, insert on the bone. So the palmaris, uh, palmaris longus, even though if we're talking more about a wrist flexor here, is the one that uh, inserts on the proximal phalanges. Okay. Then we have the flexor digitorum superficialis. Its tendon inserts on the middle phalanges. Okay. And then when we finally get to our deep flexor, digit flexor, flexor digitorum profundus, this um, 
the tendons insert on the distal phalanges. So each, each tendon, so, so the uh, tendon of the flexor digitorum superficialis comes in and moves over the top and actually splits and goes on either side of the tendon for the flexor digitorum profundus. So you've seen layers of the tendons wrapped around there. <coughs> okay. What else was I going to say? Oh, yeah. Um, sorry. Okay. What was I going to say? Oh, right. Uh, so then nerve innervation. It's going to be predominantly the median nerve again. Mm -hmm. With one exception, because we always have to have an exception. And that is the, where did it go? Flexor digitorum profundus, the medial part of it, is innervated by the ulnar nerve. So, okay. <coughs> hmm. <coughs> and remember, the tendons of all these pass underneath the flexor retinaculum, so they are part of the carpal tunnel components. All right. Got everything? Yep. Okay. Hmm. So arterial supply to the anterior compartment. Remember we have the branching of the brachial artery into our radial and ulnar arteries. <coughs> Excuse me. Radial artery obviously will send branches out to supply the lateral structures, well, the ulnar artery is going to help supply medial structures. Hmm. And then I'll just point out that the ulnar artery sends a major branch, the common interosseous artery, here, that branches into the posterior interosseous artery and the anterior interosseous artery. Anterior interosseous artery is important for supply to the deep muscles of the anterior compartment. Well, the posterior interosseous artery is going to move into the posterior compartment. Okay, I'm good. Did you say the anterior supplies The deep muscles of the anterior compartment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hmm. All right. Um, so your book talks about a fistula. Does anybody know what the definition of a fistula is? Yep, so abnormal connection between two passageways. Um, in this uh, instance, it's a fistula between an artery and a draining vein. So this would be a surgically implanted fistula um, for hemodialysis. So did anybody here have done hemodialysis as a, as a provider? Has anybody done that? Because I've never done it, so. Just if you have any extra information. No? Okay. Um, like cool. if you feel it, it'll it like kind of vibrates. It kind it's of like vibrates? We, okay. Like you can't draw you can't draw blood on that side of oh. if the patient has a fistula, they like it's like a limb alert situation. You can't do like a venipuncture on that side. Okay. Like you can, like, yeah, they're also really big. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Putting some high pressure into a into a low, low pressure vein. Okay, interesting. Yeah, I guess I'd you can't, you know, draw anywhere mm -hmm. on, that arm. on that arm. Okay. Yeah. All right. So then, then they would use that to insert the the catheter for um, hemodialysis. Then. Wow, that's kind of crazy. <laughs> Coming from a scientist perspective, that's kind of awesome. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, 
Very interesting. All right, so then innervation. <coughs> oh, excuse me. <clears throat> so we have our radial nerve that's just basically passing through, so no major branches. Then we have our median and ulnar nerves, and this again is where we get most of our um, innervation. Want to um, point out for the radial nerve, just go back to it for a moment. The deep branch of the radial nerve moves posteriorly. So this goes to the posterior compartment. And then the superficial branch of the radial nerve, this is an entirely sensory nerve. And so we'll predominantly ignore it for the rest of the class since we're not really going into the sensory nerves as much. <clears throat> All right, so then we have most of our innervation from the median and ulnar nerves. <clears throat> median obviously is going to, <coughs> excuse me, innervate uh, predominantly the more lateral structures, the more medial structures are going to inter be innervated by the ulnar nerve. <clears throat> okay. Nice story. Let's move. <coughs> Oh, excuse me. All right, so superficials of the p muscles of the posterior compartment. So um, we have the brachioradialis just kind of sticking out on its own and acts as, a, as an elbow flexor. <clears throat> and then we have, hmm, excuse me, the wrist extensor group. So wrist extensor group is going to be which muscles? Here, let's blow it up here. Yep, so here, all of these, these are our wrist extensors. All right, um, they typically um, originate on the lateral epicondyle or near it, okay, so. Hmm. And uh, most are innervated by the radial nerve. So we've gotten that deep branch of the radial nerve coming around and so radial nerve. All right. Hmm. Just a note that the extensor radi carpi radialis longus and brevis are involved in moving the wrist joint lat um, laterally too. And would this be abduction or adduction that these guys would be doing? Which ones? Extensor carpi radialis and brevis, longus and brevis. Hmm? Abduction. abduction. Okay, and so then extensor carpi ulnaris would be abduction. abduction. Hmm. Let's see. I wanted to switch colors to green. Okay, so then we have our digit extensors. Main one would be digit uh, extensor digitorum, and then to the little finger extensor digiti minimi. And <coughs> oh, excuse me. These insert onto the extensor hoods. And remember for the toes, we had those extensor hoods? Same story for the fingers, those broad triangular ligaments that, that run across the uh, dorsal surface of the digit. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, they are most often involved in the um, extension of the, of the fingers without moving the carp, um, metacarp metacarpal phalangeal joint. Wow, having trouble with my words. So kind of this motion here going to be very reliant on the extensor hoods, kind of pulling those, those joints flat there. Okay. All right. And then just a reminder that all of these structures pass under the extensor retinaculum. Okay.
Any questions so far? All right. And so the deep muscles, <coughs> excuse me. So the one we've seen before would be the supinator here. You got to see the two heads there illustrated. <coughs> Um, we have the abductor pollicis longus, kind of off on its own thumb abduction there. Uh, we have the thumb extensors. So, so the extensor pollicis brevis and extensor pollicis longus. And then we have our digit extensors <clears throat> that are, <coughs> oh, excuse me, where'd it go? The one, the one extra digit extensor that we have here is the uh, extensor indices here. So extending the index finger. All right, so these would be innervated by the uh, posterior interosseous nerves. Remember we have that, that deep branch of the, the radius coming around to the posterior surface. Part of that is the posterior interosseous nerve. All of these are? Mm -hmm. Make sure there's no, no um, exceptions that I wrote down here. Nope, they didn't write any exceptions down. So if one of them isn't, then I missed it. Okay, mm -hmm. those are the posterior compartment muscles. <coughs> okay, so remember we had our common interosseous artery and that posterior inter interosseous artery moving through the aperture just above the interosseous membrane. That's our major artery here in the posterior surface. So this is an anterior view, this is our posterior view. And then here, the posterior interosseous nerve, which is the continuation of the deep uh, branch of the radial nerve coming in to innervate. All right. um, we do, I do want to note that we have an anastomosis here at the end, distal end of the forearm. So the posterior interosseous artery and the anterior interosseous artery anastomose here. So that is the forearm. And then we'll move into the wrist and the hand. So um, I'm sure you guys are getting very comfortable with all of the bones of the wrist and the hand. <laughs> uh, so I just want to point out a few that are going to be important for our, our discussion in lecture. Um, so hmm, just a reminder that on the thumb, our first digit, we only have distal and proximal phalanges. Well, on the rest of the digits, we have the three phalanges there. In the carpal bones, they're kind of aligned in two rows, roughly. And then one of the important ones we're going to talk about is the scaphoid bone here, which is in that first row on the lateral side. It's kind of a funny boat-shaped bone right there. <coughs> Excuse me. It's interesting because its blood supply comes in through its distal end, so the arterial supply comes in through its distal end. There we go. All right. The other thing to note is that these carpal bones are arranged in an arch. So we have our carpal arch. This is going to be the posterior wall of our carpal tunnel. <coughs> That's enough on this slide. 
All right, so common fractures of the wrist. So often wrist fractures are from falling on arched, outstretched arm. I did a good job of that once. That was good times. Um, a lot of what happens is fractures of both the radia and, radius and the ulna. So this type of fracture here has a particular name. This is the Coley's fracture. So we have uh, the styloid process of the ulna breaking off, as well as you have a fracture of the radius that actually allows the distal portion of the radius to move posteriorly and proximally to where it should be. Hmm. And this is going to give rise to what they call the dinner fork deformity. So you see this kind of divot here in the wrist um, that sort of kind of looks like a dinner fork. Tines are up here. So this is um, what we call the Coley's fracture. All right, the other fracture that is often um, talked about, especially on board exams and all of that, so this is going to be one that you want to pay attention to, is the scaphoid fracture here. <coughs> and remember I said that the um, blood supply to it comes in from the distal end. You can see that here in this diagram. And so when it's fractured, and by the way, this is one of the most, the most commonly fractured carpal bone. So when, it can, when it's fractured, it can develop a vascular necrosis. And uh, really cause some problems there. So because we get disruption of the, of the blood supply here in the distal, <coughs> in the proximal end of it, sorry. Okay, so that is the scaphoid fracture. And from what I hear, this is um, very often asked on board exams and things like that. So be, be well aware of it. Okay. Here is a radiograph of it. So here's a normal wrist. You can see the uh, carpal bones nicely defined. See a really good radiograph. Very nice. Here's the scaphoid bone in its normal position and shape. So kind of a boat shaped bone. And then here, let's see if I can zoom in. We can see a fracture running through the scaphoid bone here. You can see that disruption of the radio opacity as opposed to that nice, beautiful scaphoid bone on the normal wrist. Okay. So then if the, the, this fracture is bad enough, then we would expect to see avascular necrosis potentially in this portion of the bone here, because remember our blood supply is coming in from this direction. So does it just like pinch that radial nerve or artery off? No, uh, actually ruptures that. So if, it's, if the fracture is bad enough. Mm -hmm. Kind of like what we had when we fractured the, the neck of the femur, we had that just mm -hmm. dis total disruption in the blood. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hmm. All right, so carpal tunnel. Now remember we've got our carpal arch, which is those bones there, the carpal bones. And then we have the flexor retinaculum. Where is it? There we go. Over the top of it. That forms the anterior wall. And then, um, we have the, the deep and intermediate layer tendons coming through that. So we've got the flexor digitorum superficialis, our intermediate um, layer muscle for the anterior compartment of the forearm. And then we have the flexor digitorum profundus and flexor pollicis longus tendons, our deep anterior compartment muscles moving in through the carpal tunnel. Uh, then we also have the median nerve that's running through the carpal tunnel. Do you want us to be able to like, 
Are you gonna put a would you put a feature like this in the test and be like uh, what tenon or what? Mm-hmm. I could do that. That would be a mean one, but I would potentially do that if I'm feeling <laughs> particularly mean that night as I'm writing it. <laughs> okay, so that, that is a possibility. Um, so remember, this is, what was I gonna say? I forgot, yeah, okay. So this is going to be anterior, posterior. So these are gonna be our deep tendons, right? So this is deep, this is deep, here's our intermediate. Okay, um, let's see if I can do this. So here's just some radiographs showing these tendons as dark spaces within that flexor, or that carpal tunnel. Okay, so carpal tunnel syndrome, what happens in carpal tunnel syndrome? Anybody know? The nerve gets pinched. The nerve gets pinched. What causes the nerve get pinched? Inflammation. Yep, tendon inflammation. So overuse. This is typically an overuse syndrome. Zoom out some more. So more space. So overuse. Um, causes inflammation of the tendons that then compresses the median nerve. You've got all the pain um, associated with carpal tunnel syndrome. So then how would they treat that? Retinacular release. So they cut, they sever the retinaculum, flex the retinaculum and just allow things to expand a little bit more, take that compression off. That is if anti-inflammatories don't do the job. Okay, so that is the carpal tunnel. <clears throat> then last one we talk about is the anatomical snuff box. And so if you, if you extend your thumb out and kind of tense the muscles in your hand, you can see a divot right at the, the lateral surface of the hand right there. It's kind of a divot in between a couple of tendons. That's your anatomical snuff box. And they actually used that to snuff stuff out of back in the Middle Ages. So, you know, you dump it in there, take a sniff. Okay. <laughs> Apparently. So, those two tendons that we're talking about here are the tendons of the extensor pollicis longus and the extensor pollicis brevis with the abductor pollicis longus kind of tucked in there too, bordering that. Okay. <laughs> Why do we care about this anatomically? Well, one thing, <laughs> hopefully nobody's sniffing things out of it anymore. <laughs> but we have the radial artery running through, through the floor of that anatomical snuff box. So that's one location you could potentially, if you're really good, get a, a radial pulse. Also, <clears throat> you see this bone right here. This bone right here is the scaphoid bone. And so remember we're talking about those, those scaphoid fractures. Well, one of the ways we can take a, an initial assessment of it is to palpate the anatomical snuff box. You can palpate in that scaphoid bone. If the patient wants to hit you when you do that, you've got an idea it probably is. <laughs> There's a potential fracture there. Okay. So that's one way of um, palpating the scaphoid bone is through the anatomical snuff box. All right, any questions? Well, then that's all I have to say. So we'll see you tomorrow in lab. So we just have one more lecture. That be on the that's correct. Yeah. <laughs> I hope I can finish everything in one more lecture. What? I said I hope I can finish everything in one more lecture. I feel like I have so much more left to go.